Hello, it's Reverend Barbara here. Welcome to our thought for the day. It is Wednesday and it's my pleasure to be sharing with you today. A lot's going on, isn't it? There's a lot going on in the world and there's stuff going on in church. Our Methodist Conference is meeting over the next 10 days or so, starting on Thursday. It's meeting in a very different way because it couldn't meet as it normally does and maintain social distance. So it's meeting differently, remotely, via technology. And those who had been voted to be our representatives will experience a very different conference to the one they would have experienced had the coronavirus not come. And today we hear that there will be yet more relaxing of the lockdown rules. Things are changing. People will be able to be closer physically to maintain two metres where possible, but if that's not possible, one metre plus. Of course, we realise that those things are changing to allow the economy to get moving so that businesses can go about their business, that people can begin to um, enjoy things that they once enjoyed. Someone had put on Facebook earlier today with great excitement that they'd actually managed to get a hair appointment for the 5th of July, which is the day after hairdressers open. I can understand that desire to get to a hairdresser and there's been lots of pictures around on social media implying that we're all going to come out of this with incredibly messy long hair and perhaps for some of the men, messy long beards. Cinemas and museums were can open, but not gymnasiums. Churches can open for private prayer, for worship and for weddings, as long as there's less 30 or less people and social distancing is maintained. You kind of feel like there's a part of me that wants to go, woo woo, uh, we can start getting back to normal. But there's another part of me, the sober part of me, the thinking part of me that says, actually, there is no going back. There's no getting back to what we once had. There's only a moving forward into a new reality. And I came across this uh, verse uh, in Revelation. It may surprise you to know that I'm not a huge fan of the book of Revelation, partly because it is a language that is so unfamiliar to us. What's also interesting to me is if I ever ask a group of Christians what book of the Bible they'd like to study next, I can almost guarantee that a few people will say the book of Revelation. And maybe that's partly because it is um, framed in terms that we don't necessarily understand the language is very um, unusual. The imagery is not easily understood. But anyway, I, I found this verse and I don't think I've ever noticed it before. And it struck me quite powerfully. And it feels like it has some connection to what's going on now. So let me read it. I'm reading it from the new uh, King James and it's... Um, Chapter 8 of Revelation, and I'm reading verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And the message, it says, heaven fell quiet. Complete silence for about half an hour. It's picturesque language. But I got to thinking about that half hour of silence. I got to thinking about the seventh seal, the significance of it, why the immediate reaction to that 
was this complete silence. And if I've ever imagined heaven, I've never imagined heaven has been a place of complete silence. I've always assumed that it would be quite a noisy place, that people would be praising God and singing and, I don't know, there'd be angels, etc. I never really thought of heaven being completely quiet. And half an hour is actually a long time. You, you try sitting silently for half an hour, unless it's something that you practice regularly. I think you might find that 30 minutes of quiet, of complete silence, is quite long. And you might actually struggle to find a place where you can experience complete silence. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Did God command that? Was it a 30 minutes to pause, to think, to reflect, to pray, to praise? What was that silence for? And after the silence, it says in verse 2, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So there's going to be, presumably, some noise after that silence. Some trumpets blowing. Some music. Something uh, quite strong that breaks the silence. I honestly don't know what this meant to the original writer, but I know it's captured in our Bibles for us to think about, ponder on, consider, prayerfully, carefully. And I wonder if we should find some silence I mean I guess that some of you are going to say well I've had nothing but silence for the last 12 weeks we've been in lockdown it's been very quiet because I haven't seen hardly anyone or I haven't seen anybody or I haven't been close to anybody I may have spoken to someone but only from a distance so why would we want to specifically now spend some time in quiet And if I'm honest, my reaction to this unlocking is still cautious. I am still concerned that we might be unlocking too quickly. That we might precipitate another wave. That before we know it, the infection rate will be higher. I'm also quite excited about the idea that we can't go back and we can only move forward. We must find new ways of being church, of doing church. We've found new ways during this period of lockdown. And in a way, it's almost as though everything we've done and everything we held dear has just suddenly stopped. It's come to an end. Nothing that we would normally do in terms of church life has been possible. And now we have the opportunity, perhaps, to reimagine church, to think of new ways, because we've had to think of new ways. And some of those ways will be ways that really were only for that period of lockdown, not things we want to carry on. Some of those things will be things that we wish to carry on doing. Perhaps there'll be a marrying of what we used to do with what we've been doing. Perhaps we can have a kind of pick and mix where we take from both of those arenas and pick what's good and best. Pick the things we believe that God wants for us. 
But maybe there is a sense in which we do need a little bit of silence to think about those things. Part of me is kind of rushing ahead. My head is spinning a little. My heart is wondering. I'm questioning. Is now the right time? When should we open church buildings? How will we open them? How will we manage worship? What will we do when we're not allowed to sing or not able to sing? Will there be weddings with only 30 guests? What will happen for those places that have coffee shops? Places like the Olive Grove at Central and the coffee mornings at Fullwood. Just two examples. What will, what will we do? How will we do it? And there's a lot to be done. There are risk assessments to be done. There are reflections to be had. There's the contacting of the managing trustees as we decide how we move forward. And actually, we, we don't have to do it quickly. We don't have to do it at all. We don't have to do it immediately. We can take a bit more time. We can reflect on where we've been, who we've become in this period and who we might want to be as we move forward. For many, many people, of course, the world has shifted on its axis and things have changed beyond recognition. People have lost loved ones. People have been desperately ill and slowly recovered. Some people will be left with permanent damage. Some people will have lost their jobs. Some people will have had to find new ways of working that they find difficult and stressful. Some people may be craving connection, physical connection with other human beings. And some people have been bearing almost unbearable burdens during this time. Perhaps the parents now in their 70s or 80s who chose to bring home their adult disabled child from the residential unit because they knew if they didn't, they wouldn't be able to see them until the lockdown was over. And that seemed like an impossible thing. So they've chosen to bring that adult child home and they've been caring now for 13 long weeks without any care support at all. I guess maybe you have to be in that situation to understand how difficult and stressful that could be. What about all those parents who've been coping either single-handedly or as a as a couple with the schooling of their children, the entertaining of their children, keeping their children um, safe within the rules that have been set down. And all those parents coping with a child who has mental health problems, a disability, behavioural problems. There'll be parents up and down the country, possibly at the end of what they can manage. And then there's all those people who haven't had their treatment because it wasn't okay to go to hospital. Unless you had coronavirus, you had to stay at home. So there'll be people whose treatments have been delayed and that will have long-term impact. And then there are those for whom this lockdown is not ended. There are those who've been told they have to shield for, for many, many months, some for as much as a year. And yet in the midst of all of that, of course, there's been so much that's been good. We have learned new ways of communicating, of caring, of ensuring that people that we know within our circle are, are kept informed, kept safe, kept fed and watered. Food banks have been able to go, keep going because of the generosity of so many people. There has been, there is 
a lot of good. I guess as we begin to come out of this period of lockdown a little bit more, we need to be hopeful. We're a people of faith. Of course, we need to be hopeful. But of course, we also need to be careful. Can't just throw away all the rules. We need to think carefully about what we do and how we do it. And hopefully in the midst of that, we'll find what it is that God wants from us as we face this. It's almost like um, an in-between time. It's kind of, we're not fully locked down, but we're not fully open. There is a kind of in-between period where we begin to take on board the full impact of all that's happened in the last three months. So I'm saying be hopeful. I'm saying find some time to be completely quiet. I'm guessing you won't make half an hour. Even complete quiet for five minutes would be a, a miracle for many of us, particularly if we have children and spouses and others around us in our homes. If we live in a multi-generational household, we may find it difficult to find complete quiet. But maybe we need to seek it. We need to seek God and work out what it is we're called to do now. How do we face the current challenges? Let's pray. Loving God, we, we thank you for the hope we have. The hope we have in Jesus, who came to save us and to live among us and to show us how we can live for the good of others. This time of lockdown has, has raised so many issues. It's shown us that actually life can be very different. It's shown us that when we reduce our travel and the fuel consumption, that our air is clearer, our rivers are clearer. It shows that the impact on our environment can be altered. We have learned a great deal through this period and now we are in that in-between time when we haven't quite got back to normality, whatever normality means. We're not in lockdown as we were, but we're not quite fully unlocked. Loving God, help us to know what we should do, how we should be, the ways forward. Show us how to be your church again. How to be your church afresh. How to be your church in these strange yet exciting, hopeful times. Amen. Thank you for stopping by. One of my colleagues will be along tomorrow. God bless.